Amy. <laughs> so can you guys see it? Oh, oh my God, that that is ridiculous amount of tabs. Amy. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> uh, uh, a manageable amount of tabs. Um, I need, right. I have, can you see it? Yep. Yep. So, um, ladies and gents, I was just, oh, wait, we do have one gentleman, Mr. Birkinshaw. Um, <laughs> so, we are here today to, to listen to Edie. Edie's uh, applied for Oxford and has been successful and um, has been, I've taught Edie since year 10 and it's it's been a joy. Um, I think if I think of people that um, kind of embodies English, I think it would be, it would be Edie. So, if you are thinking about applying for English, if you're thinking about applying to Oxford or Op Oxbridge, this is the presentation for you. Hopefully it'll give you lots of insight into the processes and what is motivating Edie to do what she's doing. And uh, if you've got any questions that you would like to ask at the end, please do. So I'm going to um, hand over to Edie. And when you're ready, thank you so much, Edie, for your time. It's really appreciated. Thank you so much, Miss. Um, <clears throat> okay, so cool. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, that pretty much is my, my biography. Um, I am going to hopefully, if my grades are good, um, study English at um, Oxford at Hartford College um, in September. Um, but I actually didn't know I was going to study English until I think into year 11. I've been considering it before then, but I really had um, no idea that this was what I wanted to do for a really long time. And I think a lot of people um, are surprised by that because there's this assumption that you sort of particularly people who want to go to Oxford or Cambridge sort of know what they want to do from the very beginning but I had always fallen into the trap of feeling as if English was unemployable or that it was um, as a girl who did quite well in sciences I often felt quite pressured to pursue sciences so I always thought I'd go into medicine or chemistry and um, I started to realize and some people hate this book, but it was Silas Marner for me that um, that uh, Silas Marner just made me really, really love English. And it's that was for me is when I began to realize that there was no point doing a degree in something that I just really, really wasn't passionate about. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that employability first and why a lot of people end up not wanting to apply to English, just more generally applying to English before we move on to the Oxbridge stuff. Um, so I, there is this general assumption that English is far more less it's more less employable than other sciences I think you'll hear that a lot at this school um, but also that it's a less of a which isn't even a teacher thing by the way it's just like a general culture um, and also that I think there's the worry with English that it doesn't have a specific profession that comes out of it and um, for some reason I feel like at Portsmouth there's I think maybe because a lot of parents are professionals there's this um and also because it's nice to feel that security if you're studying medicine you can become a doctor um but really that this is a entire mis entirely um, a massive misconception I think about employability in that with an English degree you can go into publishing you can go into mag um, magazines you can go into teaching you can go into generally into business because English teaches you so many transferable skills that lets you um, the sort of emotional intelligence, philosophical understanding, um, grasping of greater ideas that is so fundamental when it comes to working with people or working with um, big projects or big um, set, like sensitive ideas. So when it comes to business and ideas like that, um, it's really important. On top of that, I think the best piece of advice I I ever got was actually um, when I was trying to choose between English and sort of a science I went to talk to a chemistry graduate and an English graduate who had actually both graduated from Oxford and they both said a really similar thing to me which was whatever you are going to end up doing um you like as your job you will end up in that job whatever you study because the modern um, workplace, particularly sort of in London and places like that, places that aren't, um, or jobs that aren't distinctly professions, you sort of flit around between lots of different areas until you find your specialization and any degree will get you there. But I think that English particularly will teach you a really useful set of skills to help with that. On top of that, you've got to think about the fact that a lot of the jobs that are gonna exist for us, um, particularly in 10, you know five ten years don't even exist yet and um, particularly because of the fact that um i am um, i was about to say ia to ib of me ai <laughs> is going to be taking over a lot of jobs uh, i read in for my talk essay that ai is going to be taking up uh, something like 40 percent of jobs um in the next 10 20 years and instead of training yourself to think like maybe like a computer if you're doing a science degree english helps you to think 
really in a really distinctly human creative way which is useful in competition with computers um but also i just think useful generally and the final big thing reason i and i know i'm basically preaching to the choir here because i most of you i'm assuming you're applying for english anyway but i think it's really important to do what you love and that would be my final reason to really sell applying for an english degree is there is no absolutely no point applying to do a degree in something that you think is going to get you a job if you don't enjoy that subject particularly if as soon as it gets difficult the enjoyment is gone because you'll do that degree you'll probably dislike a lot of it and then you'll go into a a career that you hate and it just no money no for me personally i realize no amount of money in the world would make up for that so just honestly is so cliche but just to pursue what inspires you to pursue something that makes you get out of bed in the morning it's just yeah is is the best way that you can approach life and what you want to study so um i now was going to talk about oh that was that bit, why study english um so i was going to talk about the applying for english sort of ucas stuff now um particularly for oxbridge um but a lot of this is just generally for english um so it can be used either way uh, but i would really really encourage applying to oxbridge even if you're a bit unsure i think it was a super rewarding process i got a, the chance to explore so many bits of literature that i loved really push myself um and also even if you don't think you're the sort of person that should apply to um oxbridge i i mean i'm dyslexic and and i never ever thought that it would be an option that would be open to me when i was in year 7 or year 8 and so um it was just through sort of passion and hard work not some like crazy natural intelligence um so yeah seriously think about it if if you are thinking about applying for english because also the support from the school is brilliant and really helpful um so basically general outline so what happens is you come in september and hopefully um I've already Phoebe reached out for some um questions about this if you are smart you'll have some sort of personal statement draft i didn't big mistake i would recommend doing that um personal statement and ucas have to be in for october 14th um the school asks for most of the oxbridge so that's the actual oxbridge deadline the school asks for it most oxbridge students have theirs in on september for um the 14th i didn't have mine on on september 14th sorry mr berkenshaw um but that was because i was stupid about my personal statement i didn't have everything ready but it's okay sort of having that it's it's more of a an aim a goal um to get most of them in then and then the school can work through them in time to submit them because they've got to go through a second sort of verification process then after you will have submitted your personal statement and i'll go through these in more depth um in a second um in early november you have to do an elat this is just specifically for oxbridge by the way um which is a, a sort of a very similar to the gcse poetry essay you do it's like a comparison of two texts um that you see and you also have to submit an essay which is submitted work if you're applying to cambridge um you also have to do an saq that i think mr beckett will have more information on that uh, i didn't do one because i didn't apply but it's a i i some sort of um form and like survey and questionnaire really um to so cambridge gets to know a bit more about you and then you also have interviews if you get through in sort of early december so further reading um for an application for oxbridge but also just generally is obviously for english one of the most important parts of your application um i it and of course i'm sure all of you read really widely and as you know read what interests you um and so already have sort of a good um basis in your in your reading the most useful thing i think i did was i miss burton will probably remember this i think about a year ago just before you we went into lockdown i sat down and had a conversation with miss burkenshaw where we mind mapped um sort of ideas i had or areas in my reading that i had already progressed and then develop those sort of distinct themes i had already researched um the because this gave my thinking far more structure instead of just having read loads and loads and loads i it, instead i could read less and give it more of a um a body if that makes sense um to have 
distinct areas of interest to explore and be able to talk about confidently and can make connections between different texts. Um, for me, these areas ended up being uh, women's literature because it was something I'd already studied quite a bit. I love George Eliot. I was going to do my extended essay on her um, and sort of the Brontes and, and Austen, but a bit more Victorian. So um, people like that. Um, and also more modern as well. So uh, Ben, I talked about Bernardo Evaristo, Girl, Woman, Other, if you, any of you have read that, very good in my interview, um, and also Room of One's Own, that sort of thing. Then I also looked at eco-criticism um, because uh, I just found it really interesting. It was really new, a new um, idea of thought. Mr. Birkinshaw uh, knew it very well, so he could help me with that. And I'd also read this book called The Overstory, um, which I put in my personal statement. And finally, I also did Apocalypse, um, just because I felt like it was topical. And it also connected really well with eco-criticism. Um, and it has some really interesting texts that spanned a really broad range. When picking those sort of like further reading uh, themes, I would aim to have a broad range, um, some more traditional ideas like Victorian, like feminist criticism that I looked at um, is quite a, comp quite a um, well-known piece of um, and traditional, I actually would argue now, um, way of approaching literature, whereas eco-criticism was a bit different, if that makes sense. So just having a, a broad show of your ability. Um, on top of that, these areas you can also explore critically as well as just in books. Um, so yeah, that was really good. Um, another thing I would suggest with your further reading is support it with research. So that could be podcasts, um, that could be, golly, like going on, uh, you must know Masolet, getting a Masolet account going on there. Um, the school, if you want to go onto the school library page on my PGS, so many great resources, just anything that interests you. I think that's the most important bit is just exploring what you find really interesting in your reading, not what you think you should explore, um, because that, you know, everyone will then end up thinking what they should explore, but something that you think is genuinely interesting, um, yeah, and you'll fly with it, just keep going. Um, so, oh, and also on the further reading, it's also useful to have a look around your syllabus, which I think is slightly different. Um, so a good example would be, I read The Bluest Eye in class and I went away and I read Beloved just to compare and contrast. Um, so yeah, that's a really a good way to show like intellectual curiosity, for example. Um, Supercurricular, this is a term you will get so bored of if you're in lower sixth um, or if you're, by the time you get in sixth form, that you will have this thrown at you all the time. Um, Supercurricular, if you don't know, is basically meant to be like extracurricular, but more academic. Um, and so it includes things like it, it technically includes your reading, but also other things like courses that you do. I didn't do any courses or like essay competitions or um, the blog and the magazine, which by the way, are so useful, recommend that. Um, I think, and I come onto this bit in my personal statement section a bit in that I would use, if I were you, use supercurricular as a tool to develop your ideas, not as a way to show show intellectual curiosity because that'll be shown through your reading you don't need to be like oh I entered this essay competition I entered that or at least you could I personally didn't in my personal statement because of reasons we'll discuss later but um I used mainly the blog and the um magazine I, I entered like one or two essay competitions but I didn't find them that useful personally um to but in the blog and magazine I wrote articles to explore my areas of interest I did lit socks to explore my areas of interest and sort of um create theses theses and ideas surrounding those sort of themes if that makes sense so yeah um personal statement right this is where i think i learned the most personal statement if you can't already tell the bane of my existence in the first few months of low um upper sixth because i was doing ib i had like so i had all my coursework if you're an ib student i, I don't know if there are any in um, but if you you had all your coursework um it might be different for everyone and then i hadn't done a draft and it was just it was just stupid so a have a draft before you come back which they tell you to do which i hadn't done b i think um and this is quite oxbridge specific but everyone always says to an oxbridge candidate your personal statement should be 80 percent um academic and 20 percent personal mine was i mean i think I had one personal sentence in it but it was about reading so it was talking about being dyslexic it was talking about how i struggled to read and then i used that as a segue into purely academic i don't even think i said anything i'd actually done 
um, beyond my, I mentioned my extended essay, but it was mainly just presenting ideas I had had about books I'd read. And I presented it in a thematic format with two paragraphs on one on identity, which is something we'd explored. I didn't explore in class a lot with Miss Hart. And then one on like, um, oh, what was it? I think one was on crises. I was just inspired by the magazine. And also um, I felt like apocalypse and eco-criticism came together really well there. Um, also in your personal statement, I'd be super creative with the text you put in. So the best moment in my interview was when I put in a modern text, which I mentioned earlier, the overstory. It's an eco-critical text. And actually, I didn't think it was that amazing. I just thought it was really interesting. And when I, that meant that when I got into the interview and they brought it up, um, they were like, what did you think about it? We ended up having a debate on the overstory in my interview and um, it ended up overrunning that particular debate meant my interview overran by quite a while. Um, and so I really recommend thinking about things that are interesting over what you think you just should have or that is good, um, like good literature, because that itself is a debate question. Um, also on supercurricular, completely forgot, keep going to LitSoc because that's just super good and helpful and discussion and thinking and all sorts. Um, oh, choosing a college. This one you can find videos and articles about everywhere. Personally, I actually, one thing I did do, which I hadn't heard a lot of people talk about, was I, in the least stalkerish way possible, tried to research the tutors at my college. And um, Miss Hutt will know, because I never shut up about one of the tutors that um, is a Shakespeare tutor at my college, who I just think is amazing. Um, and it meant that I could kind of find people that I thought I'd, that would like to teach me, and I'd like and find interesting, because you spend a lot of time at Oxford, it's one-on-one -on -one teaching all the time. Um, so you really need to, I think it's helpful as well to get in to make sure you click with your interviewer. Because I was considering a quad college that had a, an English tutor who was um, a dictionary expert. And as a dyslexic person, I was like, I don't think that's gonna be for me. So keep that in mind as well as sort of the other things that you think about when choosing a college, like accommodation, that sort of thing. Um, interviews, scary, they really are scary. But if you do enough lit sock, if you do enough discussion, if you do enough practice, they are okay. They're not entirely awful they're hard they're difficult um they yeah by no means easy but hopefully you enjoy them if you enjoy being pushed um and yeah sort of thinking in new ways and finding new ways to think about things i thought my first interview had gone awfully well when i came out i thought it had gone okay but i was reflecting on it and i was really worried because there were some things i hadn't picked up on and they'd point it out to me and then i sort of um i sort took the ideas they'd given me and developed them, which um, Mr. Berkshire always says is to show teachability. So that, you know, they're actually quite good. Another thing I did, and you guys might not have the chance to do this because she's leaving, but I had a practice interview. The last practice interview I did was with Mrs. Robinson. Um, and that was a brilliant move because not only is Mrs. Robinson quite, it's not scary, but it was a scary interview for me. Like I didn't know her very well. I, um, it was a bit intimidating um, and she asked me really, really difficult questions. I think that practice interview went worse than my real one. The benefit was, however, she um, actually asked me a set of questions, which I ended up getting asked really similar ones to in my interview. So just doing lots of practice interviews with lots of different people, super helpful, getting lots of different opinions on your personal statement. So yeah, um, oh, I think that's the end of my slides I have. I'm happy to do any questions. I'm sorry that was really Oxbridge based. If you guys no, have anything, that was perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Lily, that, was, that was really, really great. Um, do we have any questions that anybody wants to ask? If you're in a noisy place and you want to put it in the chat, please feel free. I've just opened the chat up. Yeah, um, literally anything, even if it's just about like if it's English. I feel like that was very Oxbridge based, but um, it, you yeah. balanced it really nicely. No, Edie, it was a really good balance. Um, so thank you. Any, <laughs> any questions from anybody? You've silenced them all. Um, Mr. Just... Mr. Birkinshaw, is there anything that you wanted to add in terms of like UCAS or applying for Oxbridge? Oh, we've lost Mr. Birkinshaw as well. Oh. Ooh, one <laughs> thing though, I was thinking about extracurricular. Um, if you um, just on what's on the top of my head, um, anything that you might want extracurricular wise that you would have put in your personal statement, I had ended up having put in my reference because I ran out of space. So don't worry if you do, there is something that you think you've done that's really impressive. Um, that can go in your reference. I just personally chose to have mine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so Isabel is asking, um, what are your safe options? What are my safe options? Okay, so I have, um, 
I've applied to Lancaster, which I loved. I thought it was really lovely there. My history teacher went there. Um, and also it had a really nice flexible course. So I could have done a module in history if I wanted to, and also a creative writing module, um, which was really appealed to me. I also applied to York. That was kind of a last minute decision. Um, if you want to know my thing behind that, I think it was that it's good for English and it's collegiate. <laughs> and, um, and then I also applied to Edinburgh and St Andrews. I haven't heard from them yet. So my office from Lancaster is IB. Oh, everyone's leaving. <laughs> um, for IB yeah. is 32 points with like AB, ABB or something like that. Um, my York offer is AAA 34 points, but my Oxford offer is 38 AAA. So I don't know. It's um, yeah, Lancaster basically. Anyone else? Lovely, thank you. Um, Maddie and Daisy had to go, and so Rebecca, but they're all saying thank you. Okay. Um, I think I think we're done. I think we questions. Um, I think oh Naomi's got a hand up. Naomi. Um, sorry, this might sound stupid. But it is. Did you ha when you were applying and with IB and all? Did you have time to like balance like having a life as well? Like oh that's Naomi, I mean. don't you worry. <laughs> um, I would say so. Yeah. Well, listen. No IB student. There's a, a very famous IB triangle that says you can never have to, like all three, and it's meant to be like your life, your sleep, and your work. So IB is always a balancing act, anyway. Um, I would say, yeah. I think I think I could have handled it better. I think I could have, um, for example, done my personal statement earlier. Um, um, but I still, yeah, I still managed to the Oxbridge applications and particularly if you're doing a level because i know your year can't do ib is genuinely it was just i just made it unnecessarily stressful for myself you can definitely balance having a life going out with your friends on fridays or i mean i couldn't do a lot of that anyway due to lockdowns etc but <laughs> but um it, it becomes um yeah i i hope so i hope i have a life naomi <laughs> i don't know you can ask hamish he'll give you a good answer um but yeah <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Naomi. Good question. Well, thank you so much, um, Edie. It was really interesting listening <sighs> to your view of like your experience and the journey that you went on to to get to this oh, point. So it's really exciting. I forgot to say the most important bit, which was just that you, t you need to like the teachers are really helpful. Like, I'm not sure will help you with anything. Never mind. Though, Edie, that can was I apologise that I was late? I went up to N six and walked in on Ivy House. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they, they Mr. Reese took over the room. I need to have a word about like, that. I can see anyway. I was just... <laughs> <laughs> talking to you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. I was, I was uh, sorry. I'm going to go. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, Edie. Bye. Oh, sorry, right, thank you. Thank you. So, Edie, thank you so much. Thank oh, you. I really appreciate it. And um, Mr. Berkshaw, did you want to say anything at all? No, just thanks very much, Edie. Really. Fantastic. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, really guys. Good. Thank you. Cool. Really interesting. So thank you, oh, and I'll see you later, Edie. See you later. Bye. Bye. Take care. That was oh, all right, wasn't it? That went well. I'm just uh, going to just turn off the, um, the recording. Hold on. Oh, yes.